<laughs> How mortgage advisors can help asset-rich customers via capital gains tax. That's my title, really. And what I want to do is just update you on capital gains tax, but with a relevance to a mortgage advisor. Now, be careful, because capital gains tax is taxation, so we're not qualified to give advice on this sort of thing. But you can still talk about it, and then make referrals to accountants, tax advisors, uh, lawyers, financial advisors. There's nothing to stop you doing that. And if you want to give your client a proper service, proper um, connection, then we really do need to be up to speed with this topic. So, now, what's brought about this then? Well, the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the budget has actually announced a uh, increase in capital gains tax. Not to the rate, that's staying as it is, but to the annual exemption. And for the tax year 23-24, the annual exemption is going down to £6,000 per person. That means that you can earn that amount of capital gain without incurring capital gains tax. It's been virtually halved, and it's going to be halved again the following year, which means people will pay more capital gains tax. So let's talk about how it affects us as a mortgage advisor. Well, the issue here, of course, <coughs> is that Capital gains tax is paid when you sell an asset. So you need to have somebody who's asset rich. Having an asset, so shares, uh, antique paintings, um, houses, <laughs> unit trusts, these are all assets. And when you sell those at a profit, you pay capital gains tax. Now, of course, most of our clients, if not all of our clients, have property involved. So <laughs> let's, put a, let's put a property up here then, because we're talking here about property. It's the purchase and sale of property that could incur a capital gains tax liability. Well, that one won't because it's a bit wonky in there. <laughs> There's probably a bit of subsidence going on there. Now, of course, the, the issue here is that when somebody buys a house for their main residence, their principal private residence, then that particular property is exempt. So what we've got here, you see, we've got, um, we've got a landlord, and this landlord, she owns a property over here, which is her family home, let's call it that, shall we, which is her principal private residence. And that's where the kids live, and that's where you know the spouse lives and everything, and, and that's where they, that's their family. Now, your client over here, so let's put your client in this situation, we? Da, 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 let's put her in there. You get <laughs> your client, little ring of pearls there. She's, she's effectively a landlord, which means that she owns a second property. Now, it's that property that's liable for capital gains tax. That's the point behind it. Now, that property could be rented out to tenants. It could be a holiday let, rented out to holiday makers. It could just be a second home that they use occasionally. <laughs> They're the ones that cause all the problems, aren't they? Down by the seaside, these homes that are owned by other people, but they never, ever use them. <laughs> anyway, enough of that it's politics. But this capital gains tax, possibly. So let's look at a number of ways in which this client of yours the landlord, how she can minimise her capital gains tax because she's going to have to pay a bit more now because the annual exemption has gone down. Now, first of all, she can think about having two people. If she's on her own, that's fine. But maybe she has a spouse or a partner, civil partner, or, or somebody who's married to. So let's put this guy in here. Get it to do, put a little tie on in there to make sure. There you go. Now, that's the spouse. <coughs> now, the point is that when you own an asset, if there's two of you and you both own the asset, then you can both get an annual exemption, uh, which is great. Um, if the house is owned jointly, joint tenancy would be on it, or tenancy in common, doesn't matter. The fact is that the asset's owned jointly, so you've got two amounts of annual exemption. Now, the annual exemption is going right down now, so it doesn't matter so much here, does it? But you could find that maybe um, she's the higher rate taxpayer, he's a non-taxpayer or low rate taxpayer. She could pass the house over to him, and therefore, the, because it's spouse, civil partner, therefore there's no issue. Um, he, he wouldn't end up then paying capital gains tax. That's certainly one, one to think about. Okay. What else can, can happen here? Well, when they own the house, they can make improvements to it. So oh no, let's put a lovely little dormer here, shall we? Let's put a dormer in there, and then we'll put a little window in there. So they, they've extended the roof. <laughs> it's like my picture, do you? They've extended, well, not extended, they've, they've converted the roof attic into a habitable room with a dormer and stairs, etc. made it an extra two bedrooms, and therefore renting it out for more money. Now, that's an improvement to the property. And as long as she keeps records, so there's your records, 
of the cost of those improvements, she can offset that against the capital gains tax <coughs> liability. So if it costs, for example, 20 grand, then she can offset 20 grand from the gain that she makes from selling the property later. And that's a particularly useful thing to do. Um, Improvements, yes. Maintenance, no. So if, for example, she does some work around on the windows, she maintains the windows because they've deteriorated, start leaking, then that cost is, is, is not um, alleviable against capital gains tax. That's just something she has to incur. It's only improvements. Logically, an improvement is going to cost you money and it will increase the value. So why should you pay capital gains tax on that? Because you paid to increase the value of the property. Makes sense, doesn't it? Now, the next thing to think about now are the um, costs of the, of, the, um, of the purchase or sale. Now, we're, we're talking here about reducing the gain, aren't we, before she gets uh, applied capital gains tax. And there's a number of other costs involved in, in buying and selling the property. So the, there'll be stamp duty land tax, there'll be lawyer fees to pay, there'll be valuation costs to pay. There'll be various costs involved in buying and selling that asset. And those costs can also be reduced from the actual gain that you're making. And that's pretty good, isn't it, in its own right. So that's a few things she can do with the property. Now, if she's got her own money, there's nothing to stop you talking about, not not advising. So if, say, for example, she's got some uh, some of her own money here, yeah, yeah, that she wants to invest. There's nothing uh, to stop you talking about the fact that she can invest in um, assets. Obviously, property is the key one, but she could put that money into something like an ISA, and the ISA, of course, is exempt from capital gains tax. She could uh, invest in a REIT, for example, a real estate investment trust, which is property within an ISA, and that, of course, would also uh, be exempt from, from capital gains tax. If she's got some shares that she owns, she could do what's called a bed and ISA. Funny phrase, that, that bed and ISA. <laughs> it used to be called bed and breakfast years ago. For bed and ISA, which means she can uh, transfer the shares effectively into an ISA and, and not get capital gains tax. Now, be careful with your conversation around this one because you're not, you're not authorised to give advice in this area. But you can chat about it and then make a referral to an IFA or, or a wealth manager, a financial advisor. You should have referral conduits open for that purpose as well. Now, the other thing you can have a chat about before you make a referral is, let's get a different colour pen here as well. This property, this um, tenanted property is owned by her, for example, and she would eventually sell that and pay capital gains tax. Now, if she decided not to have done that, if she had bought the property through an SPV, so let's put the SPV over here, shall we? SPV. Now, the SPV, I'm going to put that in a big box there for you, is a special purpose vehicle. This is a limited company that she sets up for the purposes of buying that property. Now, her, her surname might be Smith, so this might be Smith Properties Limited or something, whatever she wants to call it. But the point is, though, that the property is now owned by the SPV. She buys it through a limited company, which has, its, has many advantages, disadvantages, and we talk about that in other videos. But the point is that capital gains tax is a personal thing. Only individuals pay capital gains tax. Companies don't pay capital gains tax. So to avoid capital gains tax, which is getting more expensive, she needs to buy through an SPV. But what happens, of course, is the SPV owns the property and they pay the mortgage, the rent goes into the SPV. She will get her income via dividends or um, salary. Now, those, of course, are liable to tax in their own right. There's dividend tax to pay, and then there's obviously income tax, um, national insurance on the salary. So she ne if she wants to make money from this deal, you know, income, then she's going to draw money out of the business into her pocket. She's got to pay dividends and salary. It's just like any limited company. So that's obviously a disadvantage in that respect. Now, if she hasn't even thought about that, then she needs to talk to an accountant. But unless she's been living under a rock, she would have heard about SPVs because they've been all the rage since 2016 when all the taxation changed for landlords. So have, have a think about that as well.
Um, other ways that you could minimise capital gains tax, well, there's loads. Well, way beyond your conversation, really. I mean, she could gift assets to charity, for example. She could put money in, in an EIS, an enterprise investment scheme. She could look at some kind of holdover or rollover relief where you're effectively postponing any capital gains tax charge till later. Uh, there's opportunities there as well. She could look at lettings relief, maybe maybe you know renting out uh, one of the rooms or something like that. There's different ways of of relieving the capital gains tax, which are well beyond your conversation, really. Which is why you need to get her talking to her accountant, or tax advisor, or specialist wealth manager. Somebody like that would be a help. Tell me, please, that you do have these conduits to make referrals. You should have them. You might want to become one yourself at some point. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's just ways of minimising capital gains tax, which has hopefully allowed you to understand more the taxation. Um, by the way, there is one other way of avoiding capital gains tax, and uh, this is a bit drastic. But what you can do is you can die. There you go. <laughs> if she dies, there you go. Da, 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 da. If she dies, she owns the house. And that forms part of the story. There's no capital gains tax to pay on death. Not a lot of people know that. Obviously her, her property is now forming part of her estate or get inherited by somebody. So there's going to be some possibly inheritance tax to pay. And whoever inherits the house, for example, capital gains tax liability starts from that point onwards. <laughs> that's, that's a bit drastic, isn't it? Dying to avoid capital gains tax. Although you probably probably watched a movie about somebody going off in, in, a, in a canoe you know, to falsify their death just to get rid of these things. <laughs> but that's another issue. So that's an update for you as a mortgage advisor on capital gains tax. Hopefully that's brought it to life a bit, really, as opposed to just a textbook of detail that we often get encountered to read, don't they? So I uh, hope you enjoyed that.